Good day and welcome to FinChat Podcast, where we interview professionals in the finance industry to allow them to share their experiences and knowledge to educate and expose the next generation of business people and entrepreneurs to the world of finance, banking and related topics. My name is Randy Seda and here at FinChat we recognize experience in business as a resource to learn from and we try to harness that resource as best as possible. Good day and welcome back to the FinChat Podcast. It's the final installment of the credit series. And today we're going to look at it from the lender's perspective. If you missed the previous two episodes, I'd encourage you to go back and give it a listen, as it was a very insightful conversation we had with our guest. Now, Kwasi, welcome back to the FinTab podcast. Thank you so much for being on the show. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well, and thank you for having me again. Seriously, Nali, I must say I'm quite sad. Hope we can do something like this again. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. <laughs> All right, so let's kick it off today. So again, <clears throat> you're a credit analyst at RMB. So please explain to us what exactly you do and who you manage and how. how yeah, just take us take us through that. Right. Um, so if you think about the role of of the bank, <clears throat> the role of the bank is to extend um, credit um, to different um, individuals. Um, at RMB, we focus on extending credit to large corporates, um, to be specific. So when we talk about credit, most people understand the traditional um, form of credit, which is giving a loan um, to a company. But the other side of it is um, you would have learned about um, derivatives, um, or you will learn about it soon enough in your CTA class. Um, and with derivatives, on day one, um, no one owes the other person any money. But as time goes on and the market moves, at a certain point, um, one person is in the money and the other person is out of the money. The person who is out of the money owes the other one, right? Um, and in that case, <clears throat> The one who is in the money is exposed to some kind of um, credit risk. So we can say that they have, in a way, extended credit to the other party and the other party needs to pay them. Um, And um, if they don't pay, then there's a huge risk um, to the counterparty who is in the money with respect to that um, derivative. So understanding the different types of um, credit that we extend is part of my role. Uh, and we've got various types of um, um, of transactions ranging from traditional um, credit um, to overdraft facilities, revolving credit facilities, um, to derivative forex, um, equity derivatives, total return swaps, interest rate swaps. Um, all of those need to be understood from a risk perspective um, in conjunction with what is happening um, on the on the markets. Um, then I need to combine that with a detailed analysis of the counterparty that we're dealing with. So counterparty basically is is jargon in credit um, for the other party or the person to whom we're extending credit. Um, So we need to perform a detailed financial analysis of that counterparty. Um, That financial analysis um, will look at their their financial history. Um, It will look at any unfolding issues in the market. We also look at the macroeconomic um, sort of level, what's happening in the country, how is this entity exposed um, to what's happening at the country level, what is happening in the industry, and how does that expose the company? uh, Expose the company. We also look at non-qualitative factors, non-quantitative factors, rather, um, such as reputation of the company, Um, What do other people think about this company? Do they hold them in high regard? Is there any news, um, current news about perhaps fraudulent activities, um, about the directors doing something which was illegal, because that all feeds into um, the governance of the company. With all that information, so understanding the client, we synthesize the quality of that client as a counterparty, and then we also identify the level of risk with regards to the product that we are extending to this counterparty. Um, and based on that, I issue a recommendation um, as to whether we should pr- proceed with um, transacting with the counterparty. 
you know, listeners that don't know what derivatives are, so just like a basic overview, what a derivative is, how it works, yeah. Right, so um, a derivative we can say is, um, is, an, is an instrument which derives its value from an underlying asset. So an example, um, to keep, try and keep it basic, will be like an option, all right? So let's say right now, in the current market, okay, you have seen Sassol at its lowest, lowest um, prices, and you're convinced that Sassol's price is going to increase in the future. Um, but you don't have money um, as a student, um, but you want to invest in Sassol. Then an option will be an ideal contract. Why? The op a call option gives you the right, okay, to pay a price to um, a price based on today's levels for Sassol, but you'll only pay the price in the future. So suppose um, we say a two-year option contract. That means in two years' time, you'll be able to pay the price of um, of um, Sassol today, regardless of what the price is in the future. And so this derivative instrument also has a value, but its value is derived from the performance of the real asset, which is Sassol. So as Sassol performs well, as its share price <clears throat> increases, the value of that derivative will also increase. If Sassol performs poorly, the value of that derivative approaches zero. And so we say that the derivative derives its value from the underlying asset. So if we look at a derivative, what we say is that derivative um, solely, solely, it, it's, its value is purely derived from an underlying asset, but it doesn't necessarily engage in the buying or selling of uh, that uh, asset. Um, and you uh, don't really own the asset until you exercise your option with regards to that um, derivative. Now, COVID-19, 2020. Mm. Fun time. Hot topic. Hot topic. <laughs> um, so <laughs> let's unpack that. So um, on a broad level, um, what has the impact of COVID-19 uh, had on the financial services? Okay. So it's had, it's had quite a, a huge um, impact. Um, the impact um, ranges from immediate um, to we are yet to see what's going to happen. So in terms of the e immediate section, Remember that a large part of the financial services is exposure to, let's say, um, capital markets. That will be the JSE, um, which trades bonds, as well as trades um, um, some derivatives and also trades um, um, equities, right? We have seen that um, the value of um, equities have dropped, but they've recovered. Um, but at the worst, I think we had dropped by about um, between 25 and 30 percent. Now. If we were, let's say, um, an asset manager, as an example, now an asset manager um, derives its earnings by managing a pool of assets which invests on the JSE. Um, the lower that pool is, the lower their revenues. Um, and so as the market dropped by 33%, you can imagine that um, the value of portfolios also will have followed suit and dropped by about 33%. Um, and so the earnings of asset managers um, would adjust proportionally. So that's one instance. Now, in most financial um, services companies, um, most of them have got some kind of exposure to investing. So even if you talk about an insurance company, they also invest in the JSE. If you talk about a bank, they invest on the JSE. And so they will have felt the immediate impact of price, price falls. So that's one side. The other side, which we are yet to see in its full might, okay, is the impact on the economy and how that is going to affect different types of financial services um, industries. So one thing which is, which is um, true is there's going to be a lot of jobs lost. There'll be a lot of businesses that will close, okay? Now, if their jobs lost, if businesses close, and jobs are lost, it means people will not be able to service their debt, okay? Um, if you're a bank or any financial institution that extends any form of credit, you are now exposed to huge potential losses. In fact, you are going to have to write down your loan book because the risk in the market has increased, the probability of default 
on your loan book has increased. And so you need to reduce the value of your loan book. So most banks um, are probably going to have to record huge impairments, okay, both yeah. expected yeah. and those which are actual um, sort of defaults um, on, their, on their loan books. Um, but we'll only see it with any um, sort of operational updates, but we, and we'll see the full might when the next set of um, interim financials are, are released. Um, also, so that, that is an immediate impact, but going forward, people are going to be much more cautious about taking out credit. Now they don't have as much appetite to take out credit, um, which means the banks are not going to generate um, a lot of income because their loan books are not growing. Okay, so that's going to be another um, impact, but we'll see that impact being um, more in the longer term. Um, if you are, let's say, an insurance company, now an insurance company takes people's premiums um, and they invest those premiums so that um, when there is a rainy day, they can um, um, sort of pay, pay you out to cover your, your loss, all right? Um, now, two things, we've already spoken about the investment side. They would have lost some money in the investment portfolios, but at the same time, people are reassessing um, the affordability of insurance. So what they're going to do is they're going to cancel the insurance policies, one. They're going to try and negotiate lower premiums, which most insurance um, companies have, have offered um, anyway. And those that have taken out insurance policies like life policies with investment components mm -hmm. are likely going to cash out in order to fund um, their life. If they've lost jobs, they need to fund their lives and so they're going to cash out. So that means lower premiums are coming in for the insurance companies um, and that is, that is an effect that we're going to see um, unfolding in the next set of, um, of um, financial um, releases. The other side with insurance companies is um, depending on how you distribute your product, if the distribution your pro of your product is on a face-to-face -face basis, i.e. you've got people on the ground who go and sell the insurance um, policies to your customers, then guess what? Your, your um, employees are sitting at home. They don't have that face time with the customers. And so they're not able to push the sales of the products as hard. Your premiums come down um, and that eventually affects um, the profitability of the insurance business. If people die, okay, and this is why it's so important that we manage people staying um, um, at home or people being exposed to the virus. If people die, there's going to be a huge sort of claim on the life insurance um, companies. Um, medical bills are going to increase. And so health insurers are going to have to pay um, quite a lot. And that increases claims, which then also hurts the performance of the insurance companies. So just to give you a bit of an idea of um, um, the insurance companies, um, these three sort of areas should give you an idea of what could unfold in the next coming months as companies release their operational updates. Let's talk about impact on, I guess, lenders, lenders. So from a bank's perspective, now what changes? So the impact on risk management, credit management, so now, would you be giving more or less loans? <clears throat> let's okay. just talk about that. So um, I think let's talk about um, appetite, right? Um, yes. Most likely, the bank's appetite is going to reduce, okay? But when we say appetite, appetite is relative. Um, at any given time, remember, we've got credit scores on, on all our counterparties, and we reevaluate those credit um, scores um, when there are new applications um, that come through. So we might have appetite. So our appetite is going to shift. In a bad economy, we shift towards um, highly rated counterparties. So those highly rated counterparties have got very solid balance sheets. They are highly liquid. Um, they've honored um, previous deals. The probability of them defaulting very, very low. And so we will increase our appetite for those entities but we'll decrease our appetite for um, entities that have got lower credit scores. Um, and so there could be a bit of a, of a balance, right? But this is from an investment banking point of view. 
from um, a commercial bank banking point of view where a lot of the loans are um, are being issued to individuals to the consumers okay it's going to be a double-edged sword in that um, the bank will reduce its appetite but at the same time individuals will reduce their appetite so it's not fully in the control of the bank right so if individuals because of losing jobs are going to reduce their appetite for uh, for, for for credit then unfortunately the bank is not going to be able to generate new loans. So their, their loan books are going to decrease um, quite a bit, um, but they will look for to generate um, higher loans from better um, sort of um, um, uh, customers, from customers with higher credit scores. And that's one way that they will try and counter, you know, the reduction in um, credit appetite across the economy. Okay, definitely great analysis. Now, with the payment holidays, we've been hearing on the news payment holidays been given by the banks um, during the period to to help consumers and corporates uh, go through this time. But on a bank's perspective, how does this work? Can you break right. it down? So, a payment holiday is basically um, you are begin um, what there's a moratorium on servicing of capital and interest. There's a period where you do not have to um, pay your interest or capital. So as an example, you might be given a two a two month holiday, which means during that period, you do not have to pay um, capital and interest. Um, now from your perspective, what it does is it gives you some room as to how to apply your cash flows. So if you have, if you, if you have got, um, let's say employees and you think you're going to struggle um, to pay their salaries, then this payment holiday will release more cash to you um, to, to, to keep your employees instead of retrenching them. So it gives you some kind of a, a breathing space. From the bank's point of view, however, um, the clock doesn't stop ticking. What I mean is it doesn't mean that your loan um, stops incurring interest. Okay, Interest continues to accrue for the period that the loan um, remains outstanding. The only difference is you are not required to pay your capital and interest obligations as per um, whatever agreement you signed. So very actually insightful stuff to our listeners that might have not have known this as, as I did. Now, going back, uh, you spoke about risk management mm -hmm. and credit management, right? And how it, um, how how you use that in determining. Um, how much you can give credit to your corporates now obviously with the with the economic outlook prior covid let's talk pre-covid right how were the markets looking like then and where did you think we were headed to and now also just to set the scene and add this on we've seen a lot of monetary fiscal mm -hmm. intervention and now how, how would this impact the uh, the economy and the and the and the the sector in okay. the long run. Um, so let me deal with the first part as to where we expected um, markets to head. So um, uh, first and foremost, I mean, 2018, I mean, 2019 rather, was a relatively um, a difficult um, sort of period um, economically for South Africa. Um, and we got out of the tunnel feeling as though 20, 2020 is going to be a whole um, new year. It's going to be fantastic. Things are going to be good. We are looking forward. Um, I think there had been some kind of glimpses of economic recovery, especially from the from South Africa, um, but also across the sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Um, and so we're, we're quite um, positive. There were quite a lot of, um, there was a lot of activity in the bank, um, you know, going on, lots of talks of different uh, um, sort of transactions. Um, yeah, and then COVID struck. I mean, we saw COVID um, coming from a mile away, um, but we ignored it um, by and large. Yeah. We thought it was just uh, going to remain an Asian crisis, but we had forgotten to price it. In fact, that um, the global economy has become so interconnected, so mobile, um, and yeah. someone sneezes in China, yeah. then um, yeah. sooner or later, um, you know, everyone in Africa is going to be sneezing as well. Um, and so that's when we yeah. started sneezing, it dampened, you know, um, sort of um, market um, activity. 
Um, but at the same time, remember with financial services, um, we're not like um, retailers or manufacturers, i.e. when markets are down, there's still opportunity, um, um, opportunity for business to be made um, because you're trying to capitalize um, on underpriced assets. People are trying to, um, uh, how do I put it, short sell the market because they think it's going down. Other people are jumping into the market because they think it's going to go back up. So there's still some level of activity which supports the financial services um, sort of um, um, industry. And so it's, it's all, there's always business, albeit the business has, um, has declined because trade flows and appetite for credit has, has declined. So that's, that's one side of it. Um, we were looking for a good 2020. Then you mentioned um, that there's been a lot of money, monetary policy interventions and how is that um, going to assist us? So just to highlight what has happened, the monetary interventions has been, the Saab has, uh, has reduced sort of um, um, interest rates by 225 basis points. That's 2.25% um, interest. Now, what that does is if you had a loan, um, you're paying, most loans are quoted at prime plus a margin. Now, prime is um, I think three, three and a half percent above the repo rate. And so as the repo rate moves, prime also moves. And what we've seen um, since January until now is the repo rate decreasing by 2.25%, um, um, which means prime has decreased by 2.25% um, as well. And any loans linked to prime have also decreased by 2.25%. What that does is it reduces your interest repayments on loans, okay? And the bigger your, the loan um, you're servicing, the higher the cash interest that you get to save. Now, that ho the hope is that the release of cash gives you some breathing room to continue spending, and that will show up economic activity and ensure that we don't go into um, a deep recession. So um, the hopes of the monetary policy is that people still have got disposable income and they're able to um, buy groceries that they need. They still can um, purchase um, clothing. Um, they still can engage in different economic activities um, so that um, the engines still keep cranking. And lovely point, sir. Now, you sp that kind of seems like the positive aspects. Now, what are the negative aspects can come from monetary and fiscal intervention that we've actually currently seen? Um, can you speak about the negative aspects? <clears throat> well, in this period, uh, it's very difficult to see um, the negative um, aspects. We absolutely need as much headroom as we possibly can create from a monetary um, perspective. Um, obviously, they are always monitoring um, how this is affecting um, the economy. So. Perhaps one, one downside that we can think about, but I think we've, we've already run through that phase, is um, um, interest rate um, sort of parity. So interest rate parity um, is basically a principle which says that um, the currencies, the relationship between two currencies must be proportional to the relationship of interest rates in the two countries. Okay, so let's take, for instance, the United States and let's take, for instance, um, and let's take South Africa. Okay, we're saying that the relationship between interest rates in the US and South Africa must be aligned with the relationship of the, the RAND dollar exchange. All right. Now, what happens is investors in the US are always looking for avenues um, to invest their cash. Interest rates in the United States are at um, historic lows. Yes, we're also experiencing historic lows in terms of interest rates. Um, but because of that, what happens is cash investment opportunities in the US reduce and investors are willing to take more risk more in more risky economies. And I say more risky inverted commas because emerging markets are considered to be um, more risky. And so they are willing to invest in South Africa for um, for higher returns. What that does is they sell their US dollars and they purchase rands. And what, what happens is the rand strengthens because there's greater demand for it while there is um, greater supply of the US 
dollar, right? Um, the problem is, as we cut interest rates, now the differential between potential returns investors can earn in South Africa and in the US starts to decrease. And so investors in the US start rationalizing, does the return we're earning in South Africa warrant the risk that we are exposing ourselves to? When they get to the point or the conclusion that the risk does not match the return, there is going to be a backflow of cash flows from South Africa back to the United States. And what, that ha what happens is that the RAND now starts to depreciate in value because they are selling their RANDs and they're demanding US dollars, right? And what that, what, what that does is it means things become much more expensive for, uh, for consumers in South Africa. Food is much more expensive. Um, you know, fuel is much more expensive. Um, and so the benefit of those interest rate cuts are reversed. And so there's a potential um, sort of negative of cutting interest rates. But it's a question of the economic activity which is generated in the economy, right? Is that enough to cancel the effect of cash flowing back to more developed countries? And I think on the basis um, of that, the Reserve Bank has come to the conclusion um, that not the economic activities, um, the benefits from that will outweigh any depreciation um, in the RAND. And even when the RAND depreciates, we might benefit from our mining companies who still are the highest earners of foreign currency for the country. So as the RAND depreciates, the sale of gold, platinum, rhodium, um, you, you name it, generates more cash flows, you know, and increases our foreign currency reserves in the current in the country. So it sort of balances um, things out. All right. And you spoke there about um, the reversing of the investment um, or, or foreign investments. Now, um, early, I mean, late March, we saw um, the downgrade um, of SA junk status. And then to add on to, to I, I would say, our misery, COVID came in. So now the impact on that, um, can, can you speak about, you know, basic overview, impact on that with exactly what we just spoke about now in terms of the effect of that having on investments portfolios for foreign investors and um, possible financing? Uh, to our recovery. Right. Um, so from a finance theory point of view, let's talk about investor preference um, theory. Um, the investor preference theory um, assumes that um, if, or it says that if you have got two companies, one company, or if you have, you have two types of investors, you like, you've got um, investors that want high income, and then you have got investors who want high capital appreciation, right? Then we have got a company, and what this company does is it has got high um, income. It, it pays a lot of dividends, right? It's going to attract the high interest um, or high income preferring investors. The moment that company changes its stance, okay, and cuts its dividends, that means it's investing its dividends for growth. You're going to have a lot of the income preferring investors leave, but when they leave, the high capital appreciation investors will come in. And so it will create some kind of a, of a balance. How does that relate to South Africa? The point that I'm trying to drive at is you have got investors who have got a high risk appetite, and then you have got investors who have got a low risk appetite. And so if you look at the history of South Africa, we've never quite defaulted um on on any loan so from um, um a willingness to service debt you can always tick the box for for south africa obviously what has happened in the history is not necessarily what we can expect um going forward but on the basis of that those who have got higher risk appetites those who run higher risk um, portfolios would then move into south africa why because now asset prices are lower and there's a higher chance of earning higher um income um, for them. So it's an income versus risk taking. Um, so as investors leave, there are others who are who are coming um, uh, coming in. 
one of the main drivers of people having, they're being forced to drop South African assets, not necessarily because they don't want to, but their investment mandates dictate that they can invest in a certain grade of assets, or they can invest in a certain index, which um, includes certain country um, sort of assets, okay? So the downgrade to junk status meant that um, investors whose mandates say you can only invest in high grade sort of assets um, would have to drop um, South African assets. Um, and, uh, and so the, that would lead to some capital um, flight. But if we see what happened when South Africa was downgraded, in fact, the markets rallied. And for me, I think when the markets rallied like that, it means that there were investors who were still convinced that from a credit perspective, South Africa was still good to go. And so they were willing to take the risk, um, not only from a credit perspective, but also um, they saw the potential to, have, to earn higher returns. So eventually it balances out. Um, and so even when we saw S&P downgrade South Africa further into junk, the markets did not really move. They didn't really move. Um, I think everyone has already priced in um, the tough economic um, um, challenges South Africa is going through and they've had to decide whether they'll continue to invest in the country um, or not. Thank you so much for that insightful take. Um, Pastor, thank you so much for coming on the pod. It's been a wonderful series. I've definitely learned so much. Um, thank you for having me. Again, it speaks so much to your commitment, commitment to developing young minds like my you know. So uh, it's been great. And to our listeners, thank you so much for listening. Remember, if you like the podcast, give us a favorable rating on your podcast platform. Remember to share it with your friends so that we can all learn something new. We post reports on LinkedIn, so give us a follow by simply searching FinChat. We post bite-sized infographics on Twitter and IG. So our handle is FinChatCo. I repeat, FinChatCo. Kasi, from me and FinChat, we'd like to thank you and have a wonderful thank you. day. Same to you right. and your listeners.